The Paris Agreement is an international treaty on climate change that sets out a global framework to limit global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius and aims to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius since this would significantly reduce the risks and the impacts of climate change. Nationally determined contributions are at the heart of the Paris Agreement and the achievement of its long-term goals. These NDCs embody efforts by each country to reduce their national emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Article 6 of the Paris Agreement has been a popular topic in recent years and it provides guidance on the international trade of carbon credits and the setup of a centralised carbon market overseen by the UN. Article 6 was also greatly discussed at the 27th Annual UN Meeting on Climate, more commonly known as COP27. While some countries have made progress through signing of bilateral carbon market agreements with each other, such as Singapore and Papua New Guinea, further discussions pertaining to Article 6 texts are set to drag into this year. One key pain point is the transparency of accounting for international carbon transfers and the implications on double counting. As part of countries' NDCs to transition to a low-carbon future, implementing a carbon tax has picked up momentum in recent years to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. So going back to fundamentals, the carbon tax captures the negative externalities of emissions and shifts the burden to those responsible for it. In Singapore, the carbon tax was first implemented in January 2019 at $5 per tonne of carbon dioxide as a broad-based price signal to encourage companies to reduce their emissions. To maintain a transparent and fair price signal across the economy, the carbon tax is applied uniformly to all facilities across all sectors that directly emit at least 25,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions annually, and this includes six greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and hydrofluorocarbons. The carbon tax will be raised from $5 per tonne to $25 per tonne in 2024 and 2025 before gradually increasing it with a view to reach $50 to $80 per tonne by 2030. This will provide a strong price signal and impetus for businesses and individuals to reduce their carbon footprint in line with national climate goals. Countries with the highest carbon tax globally include Sweden and Switzerland, and Singapore's current carbon tax of $5 per tonne is still relatively low, but the gradual increases will bring Singapore's carbon tax closer to the global leaders. Carbon markets have grown rapidly in recent years, and they are constantly evolving. Many Asian economies are stepping up efforts in operationalizing their own carbon markets or improving existing ones through greater coverage, increased data transparency, as well as more stringent enforcement. For example, a global platform anchored in Singapore known as the Climate Action Data Trust was launched in December 2022 by the International Emissions Trading Association, the World Bank and the Singapore Government. This platform aims to build confidence in carbon markets and enhance the transparency of the international carbon credit trade. Announced at budget last year, carbon tax liable companies in Singapore may utilise high quality international carbon credits to offset up to 5% of their taxable emissions from 2024. A limited quantum of 5% has been set to ensure that the industry continues to prioritise domestic emissions reduction while providing an additional decarbonisation pathway for hard to abate sectors that may find it challenging to significantly cut emissions in the short to medium term. China is also looking to strengthen the measurement, verification and implementation mechanism for its ETS. This is because market participants are cautious about the market outlook, with urgent problems such as data quality and lack of enforcement pertaining to data fraud, resulting in low liquidity in the ETS. On a recent development, the voluntary carbon markets have been trading with a bearish tone recently, with a steep drop in prices seen on the exchanges, following the Guardian's article revealing that more than 90% of rainforest carbon offsets by VERA are junk offsets that do not represent genuine carbon reductions. Silvera, that is a carbon offsets ratings agency, published a response to the Guardian's article with their own analysis of rate plus credits on the market. It found that 31% of projects rated are of high quality, which is a more hopeful value than what the Guardian reported, but is still a concern. Because of this, the nature-based segment of the VCM came under pressure, and the impact extended to other segments of the VCM such as the renewable energy credit sector. Such controversies have cast doubt on the credibility of VCMs and while it is a problem that some credits do not deliver the benefits they claim, VCMs are still one of the funding mechanisms for the conservation of carbon sinks and valuable ecosystem services. It is therefore urgent to address the inadequacies in carbon offsets, such as frameworks and definitions on what constitutes a high-quality carbon credit so that people can confidently engage in VCMs without risking greenwashing accusations. 
The Singapore government spoke about this issue in response to a parliamentary question, especially because there are implications as carbon tax liable companies in Singapore will be able to use carbon credits to offset up to 5% of their taxable emissions from 2024. Singapore is now finalising the environmental integrity criteria for the international carbon credits that are eligible for a carbon tax offset and a white list of acceptable credits will be published later this year, which will include eligible host countries, carbon crediting programmes and methodologies. To wrap up, I have three key takeaways. The first is that with greater momentum towards net zero and climate commitments, the demand for high quality carbon credits in the Asian markets is expected to increase. But while carbon markets are important, it is also important to be mindful that carbon credits are not a distraction from achieving actual emissions reduction. The next key takeaway is that there will also be greater scrutiny on how governments are implementing the carbon tax. The carbon tax needs to be appropriately priced to urge businesses to transition towards greener operations. At COP27, the IMF said that carbon taxes should go up to 75 USD per tonne by 2030 to change investment and consumer behaviour. It may therefore be necessary for some countries to relook at the carbon tax and gradually increase the tax like what Singapore is doing to catch up with the carbon tax rates in countries like Sweden and Switzerland. This way, there will be a strong price signal and can urge companies to transition towards greener operations. The last key takeaway is that there should be robust and additional safeguards to ensure that companies purchase only verified and legitimate carbon credits and that emissions reduction efforts should be prioritised before using carbon offsets for residual and unavoidable emissions for hard-to-abate sectors.